Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming my good friend, Dr. Doug Marlowe. Wow, thank you, Judge Rancourt. I actually, I really wasn't sure if you had changed up and you were gonna introduce somebody else instead of me. Okay, why would we do this to you? You guys are already working too hard with not enough. You're already the absolute best the criminal justice system has to offer. Absolutely, give yourselves a hand. You have set the stage for sentencing reform. You've changed the, the words, the language we use in the criminal justice system. And here, NADCP comes along just as you were celebrating your 25 years of amazing success and puts more weight on your load. Why would we do that? And I want you to please understand, we had to. The time has come. The 10 key components have taken us very far. They are our constitution, but it's time for a code. It's time for statutes. It's time for more specificity. It's time to take what was once a new grassroots field and move it into the echelon of a truly established, mature profession. By developing best practice standards, we have now put ourselves at a level above any other behavioral treatment or criminal justice program. We are now in the company of medicine in terms of our procedures, our principles, and what we say that we do, and how we maintain fidelity to our model. Now, why did we have to do this? First of all, because we need to be able to put null uh, findings in context. If you look at the meta-analyses on drug courts, you see that drug courts are reducing crime an average of 10 to 15 percent. I say that to you all the time, and I, I don't like to have to say that, because there are lots of drug courts out there cutting crime in half knocking crime down 50 or 60 percent, and they're being watered down by the drug courts, the 8 to 16 percent, that are just not getting the same bang. They're not getting the effect. Then there are the drug courts, and thankfully few, but there are enough of them to be worried about, that are actually engaged in practices that are increasing recidivism and making some people worse. And we are responsible for them. Until and unless we say what good practice is, we can't say that those programs are not applying our model. We can't disown them, we can't distance ourselves from them, and we can't force them to change. And we have to. We can't allow our wonderful model, we can't allow programs that have been around for a while to fall back, to drift back on old habits. We all do that. We have to stay fresh. We have to prote protect our brand name from programs that call themselves drug courts, but none of us would recognize them as a drug court if we went there, that have dispensed with status reviews, that have dispensed with positive reinforcement, that have dispensed with drug testing, that, believe it or not, have dispensed with treatment and think they're drug courts and call themselves drug courts. And we have to say, that's not the model. We have to define the standard of care for ourselves. There's going to be a standard of care imposed on us. We can either say what it is, or the appellate courts will say what it is. Every month, there's another case in which some drug court was engaged in a practice. That practice is challenged, and appellate courts have to tell us what the appropriate practice is. If you have standards, they will hold programs accountable to their own standard. If we don't have a standard, they will create one. And we might not like what the appellate courts create for us. There are also congressional committees and federal agencies and state agencies and other organizations developing what are essentially their beliefs about how our model should be applied. 
and are telling drug courts as a condition of funding, this is what you have to do. And it's, if we don't define that standard, if we don't tell the feds what it is, they will tell us what it is. We have to reduce legal and constitutional errors. When all is said and done, drug courts are first and foremost, ultimately, courts. These are courts of law. And courts of law require procedural due process. You have to have standards. When I waive my rights to come into your drug court and agree to the procedures, it has to be clear what those procedures are. Otherwise, my waiver is not knowing and intelligent. When judges impose conditions of treatment and supervision, they have to be rational. And if you don't have standards, it's hard to establish the rationality of your requirements. And this is troubling the appellate courts. It troubles them about us. And they say so. And so we have to define what our standards are. You are the most fair people in the world. But even the most fair people in the world can behave in ways that betray unconscious, unknowing, unintentional bias. If you have standards and you follow those procedures, you are not likely to treat some people unfairly or differently than others. And we all do it. And standards will help us to avoid equal protection and other constitutional issues, and because it's the right thing to do. You guys are arguing for services. You're going to your state legislatures and saying, we need money because we need more treatment, we need more this, we need more that. Well, they say, where does it say you need that? Now you've got political support, cover, argument for what the standard is, the research support behind it, so you can go and advocate for the services you need and your participants require. This demonstrates the maturity of our profession. We now have standards. We are now a legitimate, mature profession. That means a lot. Again, congratulate yourselves. And this is the most important reason of all, because we care about getting it right. It's the right thing to do. We need to have standards. We need to tell people what the right thing is. And so the time had come, and we're doing it. And, and you were all with us every step of the way. So what did we do? We had an expert drafting committee. These were the writers and the researchers, 27 professionals, plus our board committee, you can add another five on top of that, that were going to the libraries, doing the research, writing draft standards, reporting out, days on end, locked in conference rooms until we were ready to kill each other, quite literally. Then, when we had our draft standards, they went out for peer review. We had over 50 professional peer reviewers. Every single standard was reviewed by a minimum of 25 to 30 professionals that actually read them, wrote reviews, and went online and rated them for three things that we wanted to know. Is it clear? Is it clear from this standard what you're supposed to do or not do? Number two, is it well justified? Did we make you, do, we, do you now agree after reading it why it's important and you need to be doing it, should be doing it? And finally, how hard will it be for you to do it. How hard will it be for the field to get up to that level? What proof did we require? The better research got better weight. Experimental controlled studies paid, got the most attention. Quasi-experimental match comparison samples got attention, but less so. Observational studies, when people went into drug courts, watched what happens, made notes, and saw how that affected outcomes. If it was systematic, it was included. And we asked people, not us, but the researchers, did studies of participants, staff, and if it was systematically co collected about what was working in the programs and what wasn't, it made it. If it didn't at least meet these standards, it was not discussed, it was not included. Intent to treat analyses means we did not only look at studies that only looked at successful cases. We wanted to know what separates successful from unsuccessful cases. And so unless the researchers reported the unsuccessful cases and they were just trying to show the best, we didn't learn from that. So we needed the good studies. We were most interested in studies that occurred in a drug court. If it couldn't be a drug court, then another problem-solving court, a mental health court, a community court, a DWI court. Or then 
for another program for dr drug-involved offenders like the people on probation or Proposition 36 or other programs for drug-involved individuals in the justice system. And then finally, research from traditional criminal justice and substance abuse programs. In other words, we had to review so many different databases to make sure that we had all the kind of research from treatment, criminal justice, law. And then we were interested in the reliability of the findings. If they were found, the same thing was found in 30 or 60 or 90 drug courts, we were more interested than if it was found in one drug court. If there were meta-analyses done on it, if it was replicated over and over, if there were large samples, if it wasn't just something we found in, in uh, urban environments, but it was also true in rural environments, on the West Coast, the, the uh, East Coast, the Midwest, and was there any evidence contrary to what we were finding? We promised that there would be no surprises or curveballs. Any of you that have been to a training conference within the last five years will not find anything in these standards that you hadn't already learned and been taught. This is, there are no surprises. This is things that you've heard at conferences, you've read in our journal, our practitioner fact sheets, everywhere you've gone. We wanted to avoid ambiguity and hedging. There's not a lot of soft language in here because the fact of the matter is, if it's a best practice, then it's a best practice. It may be hard to do, not all programs might be doing it currently, but a best practice is what a best practice is. We wanted to make sure that they were measure a bull and enforce a bull. That doesn't mean that we're forcing them on people. It means that if you wish to use to enforce them in your own jurisdictions, you could do so. They're specific enough that you could hold people accountable if you chose to do so in your own counties, your own programs. There were a couple, a few of what we're calling conditional escape clauses. Okay, I know it sounds like contractual, but there were some times when the best practice is something that may be so hard to do that we, re we can't expect many drug courts or most drug courts or all drug courts to do it, so there had to be a way to, to get out conditionally. So for example, we say target high risk, high needs offenders, you're all aware of that. But many drug courts can't or for humane reasons, don't want to only treat the highest risk and highest need people. So it says, if you can't, then develop alternative tracks and don't mix your tracks. We say that drug courts should have access to the full range of treatment, residential treatment, recovery housing, intensive outpatient, outpatient. But some of you are from rural environments and that may be impossible for years. Under those circumstances, if you don't have the service level they need and they can't succeed because the service isn't enough, then the presumptive sentence becomes a ceiling and they get credit for their efforts in the program. If the treatment failed them, we don't augment the sentence. We tried our best, they tried our best, and there's credit. So there's an opportunity for a conditional escape. And there's no enforcement mechanism written or contemplated in the standards. Enforcement is something that you will decide on at your own level of the AOC, your own courts, your own Supreme Court, your own programs. We are here to teach you and help you get to the level of these standards. That's our job, is the TA and the training and the help to meet the standards. Each standard has a general principle. We call it the black letter. We'll get into some of them the basic issue that we're trying to address. Then there are the specific provisions that are measurable and enforceable and specific. Every single standard is followed by a commentary with justification, kind of like the, the model penal code, where you read the section and then you read the commentary, which goes into more detail about the thinking, the why, the justification, the rationale. And then a list of all of the references to support what it is you're supposed to be doing and, and to, to show where, where we got that information from. As Judge Rancourt mentioned, we have volume one has been issued at this conference. Volume one <clears throat> addresses first, standard one is the target population. Please, please, please understand, everything flows from this first standard. If you are not treating high risk, high need individuals, which we've been 
harping about, if you're treating a different population, then the other standards may or may not apply. And therefore, if they don't apply, they don't apply because you're not hitting that target population. Standard number two, and it's not number two by accident, is our standard relating to historically disadvantaged groups, individuals who have experienced sustained discrimination, reduced social opportunities historically because of race, ethnicity, gender, are entitled to equal access, equal services, equal results as everybody else. We all know that. We all know that, but we are codifying it, and we're codifying it right after target population as a central theme of what drug courts are all about, which is racial justice, ethnic justice, justice for all, equal protection. I mean, we are the courts. We're the justice system. This is our job. Roles and responsibilities of the judge Incentives, sanctions, and therapeutic adjustments. An incentive is a reward that you want. A sanction is a punishment you don't want. And a therapeutic adjustment is neither a reward or a sanction. It is a change of treatment plan. And we are not going to treat treatment anymore like a carrot or a stick. We're going to be very clear that treatment is treatment. Sanctions and rewards are responses to behaviors, rewards for good behavior, punishments for bad behavior, treatment is to remediate sick behavior, and substance abuse treatment, which is our standard focusing specifically on the treatment services. In volume two, we will focus on what we're calling ancillary services, which would be vocational rehabilitation, criminal thinking, those psychiatric services, so those are not covered in this standard. Let's get into the standards themselves. And of course, we don't have time to go into great detail, but we can hit the high notes and give you a sense of what's coming. First pop, uh, standard target population was reviewed by 32 reviewers. Their scores from one to five, these are the averages. They were scored above four on clarity, justification, and just short of four on feasibility. And it's not surprising, it's always been recognized that Bringing all the programs up to snuff is going to be our hardest job. We know what to do and why to do it, but doing it is always going to be the hardest thing. The general black letter principle is very simple. Eligibility and exclusion criteria for the drug court are based on empirical evidence. People are targeted or excluded because research establishes that that's who drug courts are for and that's who gets better. It's not just, we used to teach, get together and decide who it is you want to treat. The problem is, when programs were just doing that on their own, the criteria were not hitting the very people that needed drug court the most. And they were having sometimes disparate impacts on racial groups and the like. So we're sticking with the evidence. The assessment process is evidence-based. You don't just sit around and decide who you think you can work with, but you follow structured procedures for entry into the program. Eligibility criteria measured number one. Your eligibility criteria are objective and defined. They're not subjective. The team doesn't sit around and say, is he ready for us? Is she motivated? Is this the kind of person we think we can work with? And the reason we're not doing that is because we are not very good at figuring out who it is we can work with. Nobody is, and so we need to stick to the evidence. You know that we're targeting high risk, which means difficult to treat, and high need, which means they really need the treatment. That's who the drug court model was built for. The 10 key components apply to high risk, high need, and are not necessary, not worth the cost, and sometimes, frankly, harmful. When we over-treat or over-supervise, we're hurting people. We don't mean to, but we are. And so if you've got to take lower risk or lower needs people in, you've got to change your program so that you're not over-treating, over-supervising, or over-involving yourself in the lives of, of individuals. 
Use structured diagnostic tools rather than clinical judgment. I'm not saying that clinicians don't have good judgment, but our decisions are not as good as the assessment tools. If you're going to have disqualifications from people based on their criminal history, those should be based on who gets best in drug courts, who do drug courts help. If your program is targeting only drug possession cases, and we know that the theft and property cases are actually getting better effects and are more cost beneficial and have better public safety impacts, then you need to stretch your criteria and hit the people that research says is who needs you. Now, of course, we say, barring legal prohibitions, if the law doesn't let you do it, we're not going to force you to violate the law. But we are going to give you evidence about maybe why the law should be changed, why this is a different time and we need to be changing who we target. And clinical disqualifications. Disqualifying people who need the most services is the opposite of what we should be doing. We should be targeting the people who need our services the most, the most in need. So well, mental health symptoms, you're out. Prior treatment failure, you're out. Prior drug court failure, you're out. The constant exclusions that systematically take the people who need us the most out need to be rethought. And so unless you simply don't have the services and can't treat them, Let's stop being exclusive and try to start being more inclusive and specific. <laughs> Historically disadvantaged groups, which I mentioned is basically our, our effort to ensure and continue our emphasis on social justice. There are the ratings for clarity, justification, and feasibility. We can do this. It's clear what to do. We know what to do. We don't need another committee to investigate whether there are disparities. We don't need another committee to talk about what to say about this issue. We don't need to reaffirm what we already know. What we need to do is investigate, a duty to investigate, and remediate. That's what we're saying. That we are going to clean, we can't change all the criminal justice system yet. But we can, we can clean our own house, and we can show everybody else how we take care of business, how a, how a socially responsible profession looks at itself, takes a fearless moral inventory of its actions, and then changes those actions. I mean, we're going to lead by example. There's no rocket science here. The principle is simple. Members of historically disadvantaged groups are entitled to and have the right to the same access, the same services, the same opportunity to participate in and succeed in drug courts as any other program, period, end of conversation. We are, there has been a legal nicety, and it has to be for constitutional reasons that it's okay to have a discriminatory impact, or it's not necessarily not okay to have a discriminatory impact if you didn't mean to. What we're saying is motives are important, but they're not enough. If what we are doing, if something that's within our own control is having a disparate impact, it's our obligation to change it if we can. So if our eligibility criteria are inadvertently excluding members of a disadvantaged group, we adjust those eligibility criteria to raise their representation until and unless there's evidence that that would be a danger, a direct danger, to public safety or the effectiveness of the program. The presumption is that the criteria are non-discriminatory in effect or are changed. That's the presumption. Equivalent retention. Minority groups are graduating in drug courts at a lower rate, not in all drug courts, I don't even know if I can say it in most, but in many are having substantially lower graduation rates. That's unacceptable. And there are many drug courts that are saying that we don't know if that's the case in our drug court. We've never looked at it. The answer is we have an affirmative obligation to look under the rock, see if there's a problem, and if, if there is, 
take concrete steps, develop a remedial plan, evaluate the success of our remedial actions, and if it worked, congratulate ourselves and tell the world how we did it, and if it didn't work, try again and come up with an alternative process. Equivalent treatment, this is obvious. Everybody should get the same level of care and quality of treatment. The same kinds of sanctions and incentives are given out without regard to people's backgrounds. By the way, there's no evidence that drug courts don't do that already. The evidence suggests we're good at this. Once they're with us, we tend to treat people relatively equivalently in terms of services. The same outcomes, if you succeed, you get the same benefit. If you fail, you get the same detriment, and that's equivalent. And staff have an affirmative obligation to learn two things in training. Number one, how do you identify cultural or, or uh, biases in your program? How do your researchers look at the data and figure out if there's a problem? You've got to learn how to do it. It's actually not that hard. We're going to teach people how to figure this out. And then number two, learning to identify our own biases. We have them. We don't know they're there. We all have them. Let's stop being defensive. Let's say we do. Try to think about it. Look for it. So just being sensitive to these issues, but as importantly, or more importantly, taking corrective measures. We know how. Roles of the judge. We have, here's the scores for the roles of the judge. Almost uh, really close to five on clarity, justification, and feasibility. We want a lot of our judges. We always have, we always will, sorry. Updated contemporary knowledge, active engagement in the program, regular involvement in all meaningful aspects of the program, a professional demeanor. You, we're watching you. Everybody's watching you. And the way you talk, the way you interact, the way you treat people. And so we want to call attention to the importance that we're all looking up to you because you have tremendous power and authority in this society. And so we just saying what you already know. And the independent judicial decision making, taking into consideration the knowledge, expertise, and input of your expert team members. Professional training. I did go to a state not too long ago, met with every judge in the state, and asked them to raise their hands if they had been to a drug court training in the last five years. And almost to the person, nobody raised their hand. Okay, That can't happen. Judges have an affirmative obligation to be well-trained, regular contemporary training in constitutional law, judicial ethics applying to drug courts, behavioral treatments, community supervision. Yes, you have to know everything there is to know about urine. I'm sorry, you do. <laughs> Length of term, we now know that rotating annual assignments are simply destructive. We're dealing with people who are always losing their caretakers. We're dealing with people who can never rely on anybody in their lives, and then we put them into a program where the most important person leaves the bench before they're finished their treatment. We can't have that. Tr drug court judges are most effective in their second, third, fifth year, and so we want them to be, we want to give you a reason for going to your PJ and say, no, annual assignments are counterproductive and they shouldn't be used. A consistent docket. I want to see the same judge every day. You're too important to rotate. Of course, absences happen, but as a regular thing, regular rotations are too damaging. You're too important to these people to not be the one thing they're, many, very often their parents warrant, which is consistent, reliable, dependable there. Pre-court staffings, you got to go. We don't, there, it's not a team without the judge. The judge has to be there regularly running that interaction. The judge is the leader among equals, and judge has to be at those pre-court staffings. Status reviews, you've heard me say this a thousand times, bi-weekly the, until the case stabilizes, monthly thereafter. Got to keep the status reviews going regularly. For some reason, you guys can make magic in three to seven minutes. I don't know why, but you can. And so that's what we're asking, three to seven minutes of your time per participant. In other words, they just need more of you. They need you. We all do. Judicial demeanor. I don't have to say this out loud, but unfortunately in some places I do. 
never any reason to yell at somebody. There's never any reason to call somebody names. There's never any reason to shame somebody. I'm sure there's nobody here that would do that. But there are drug courts out there that are doing that. And we, one thing that we're not going to do is add emotional wounds to people who are already emotionally wounded. We're not going to shame people who are already shamed or humiliate people that are already humiliated. So emphasis on how important you are. And judicial decision making, yes, this is a non-adversarial process, but ultimately the judge decides. The judge decides after taking information from the rest of the team, considering it, relying on their expertise, not imposing expertise on others. If a judge doesn't know about treatment, then the judge isn't making a treatment decision. The judge is relying on his treatment experts, but the judge is ultimately making the decision. It is not true democracy. It was never intended to be a true, complete democracy. The Constitution requires judicial independence and judicial leadership. Incentives and sanctions, 25 reviewers. There are scores, again, all exceeding four out of five. Predictable, fair, consistent, and evidence-based. Number one, people have a right to know in advance what the sanctions and rewards are and what are the behaviors that they will get it from. We have to put that in writing, and people have a right to know. If they don't know in advance, how can they waive their rights? How can their waiver be knowing, voluntary, and intelligent when we didn't tell them what would happen to them if they engaged in various infractions? Now, I'm not saying it's rigid and you have to follow it every time. You can have a reasonable level of discretion, but it's time to start putting our principles of behavior modification in writing up front. People have a right to explain and tell their side of the story, even if what they say is usually ridiculous and manipulative and actually usually humorous. They still have a right to say it. They have a right to stand up in court and make their arguments. And if they're too nervous, too cognitively impaired to do it, let their counsel speak up briefly. It's, it's OK for counsel to walk up to them, put a hand on their shoulder, help them explain what they're trying to explain, and then go ahead and impose the consequence you were going to anyway. But an opportunity to hear. Equivalent consequences, if I'm two people in the same phase of the program, same infraction or same accomplishment, same response. Predictability, consistability, uh, consistability and fairness. I have a PhD. Uh, <laughs> Again, professional demeanor. There's no reason to shame people who are already ashamed. Okay? There's no reason to yell. There's no reason to put people down. Progressive sanctions. If your program starts with jail sanctions and works up from there, those are not progressive sanctions. That's not progressive anything. Okay? We need to build gradually escalating consequences. And if the behavior is difficult, then we build our consequences up slowly. If the behavior is easy, then we can start with a higher magnitude consequence. Now, I'm not going to give a lecture on proximal and distal here. You've all heard it a thousand times. Licit substances. I don't care if somebody has a prescription for marijuana. I don't care if, they're, if the alcohol is already legal. I don't care if they have 75 prescriptions for Xanax. Actually, I care deeply if they have 75 prescriptions for Xanax. But what I'm saying is you should not feel that you cannot respond to a participant taking something that is known to be addictive and intoxicating unless you have competent medical evidence that the treatment is medically indicated, that alternative effective treatments are unavailable, and if the person's treatment is monitored by a physician or medical practitioner with expertise in addiction psychiatry or addiction medicine, you're not required to accept the person who got the prescription card on Venice Beach as they have, well, they have a prescription. You know, it is what it is. They are in the criminal justice system. I release you from this uh, obligation to, you know, I mean, now it does require 
that you're going to need to have physicians working in your programs advising you on when prescriptions are medically indicated because sometimes they are. I'm going to need to move faster. If somebody's trying and not getting better, the correct, the correct response is to adjust treatment, not increase sanctions. If they're trying, we need to have be better in our treatment development. It is as important or more important to reward good behavior as it is to punish bad behavior. We all know that. Phase promotion, people should move through phases based on development and treatment meeting concrete clinically relevant milestones. We don't move people through treatment based on how long they happen to have been in treatment. The fact that someone's been in treatment for 90 days is irrelevant if they have not initiated abstinence or if they have not reduced withdrawal symptoms or met other clinical indications. We also do not reduce drug testing until we've reduced everything else through the phases because if you reduce drug testing too soon, you won't know a relapse is coming until it's full blown. Jail sanctions, jail is important. It is part of the model. We should use it. We should use it judiciously and sparingly. We use it when other sanctions have not worked. The optimum jail sanction is three to five days. After that, jail sanctions become counterproductive. We know this. We've known this for decades. Longer does not necessarily mean better, and very often it means worse. So jail is there, but it's there staccato, when appropriate, and then back in treatment. And termination, it's important that when people are terminated, that they receive a consequence. If I leave the drug court and then I go on probation and I now have less requirements than I had when I was in the drug court, then drug court's not going to succeed if there's no leverage. And if you're going to augment the sentence, I have a right to know in advance what will lead you to decide whether or not to augment my presumptive sentence. That's something that people should be told in the waiver agreement. Substance abuse treatment, I've got to move a little bit more quickly. Substance abuse treatment, 30 reviewers. I would point out that the lowest score of all was in feasibility for substance abuse treatment, getting up uh, services up. It's not the clinician's fault. You're working in a system that's poorly financed. We're hoping that the ACA or other changes in Medicare will bring better quality opportunities to get treatment up to snuff. By the way, that wasn't a political endorsement of anything, of any particular view, but if it's coming, we're happy about it. Based on treatment needs, substance abuse treatment is based on treatment needs and it's evidence-based, essentially, period. In other words, it's got to be good quality and it's got to be what they actually need and not used for some other purpose. A full continuum of treatment is required. You cannot treat addicts if you don't have residential recovery housing, intensive outpatient, outpatient, detox, medications available. Doesn't mean you use them in any case, but they're available. If you don't have them available and I fail your treatment, then at a minimum, you should not be augmenting my sentence for failing the program. If you, I mean, it's not rocket science for defense counsel to say if this person is really addicted and is likely to fail because the treatment is not of high enough pet caliber and he's going to get a higher level of punishment, then I'm not going to recommend drug court to the people who need drug court the most. And there are defense counsel out there that if they will only recommend to the drug court the people who probably could quit easily on their own because they're afraid. It's one thing if someone commits an intentional willful infraction. It's another thing if they can't get better to augment the sentence. In custody, treatment should be used as rarely as possible. The idea of putting people into custody as a way to get detox for them, as a way to get them off the streets, it's for their own good, is really counterproductive. People should not be going into custody, people should not be going into custody except for punishment. You don't go into custody for treatment. Team representation regularly in team meetings, clinicians are there in team meetings, and they are there regularly in status reviews. An adequate dose and duration of treatment. We know how much treatment is required and we need to be able to deliver it. Treatment modalities, where if some, there are some people who can't handle group therapies. We need to be aware of who should be treated on an individual basis. The use of evidence-based and manualized treatments is critically important in this population. Medications, when medically indicated, should be used. 
Providers need adequate training and credentials. Emphasis on peer support groups, entry into 12-step or like peer support groups is critically important. And the most important phase of the drug court is the last phase. And we've got to treat the last phase as the most important phase. I'm out of time. I apologize. But at least we've given you a flavor for what's coming. Thank you so much for your attention.